Um, I thought what I would do today, and this is a talk I've given on, on several occasions, is, is talk about a specific product in healthcare which brings together not only manufacturing, how do you do it, but a really a seismic technological shift and a lot of the policy decisions within government and the industry that work both for and against this particular product. Um, I call it the economics and politics of diabetes for a couple reasons. Anybody in the room diabetic by any chance? You know, last year, last year we had a couple, they were type one. Anybody in your family diabetic? Do you know? Yeah. Um, I'm surprised. That's a very low number. Some of you are probably not raising your hand on purpose because the incidence is somewhat striking. And one of the things you'll leave with today is an understanding of the fact that you guys are going to pay for it. Okay? There should be absolutely no doubt that the societal cost of this singular disease is going to be borne by your generation and the next couple unless we do something fundamentally different. And that question is, what's that going to be? So what I'm going to do today is walk you through a couple of different things. One, a few numbers on diabetes, what it is, how we've gotten to where we are today. Talk a little bit about my company. Um, we play a very fundamental, albeit unseen, role in the delivery of diabetes care. And then I'm going to shift to a product called Exuber. Is anybody familiar with Exuber? Anybody remember reading about it, hearing about it? Okay. Traditionally, diabetics are treated in the first stage by oral medications. Usually, if you're pre-diabetic, that's sufficient for a couple of years. But as you get older and your pancreas is less able to keep up with your carbohydrate intake, people gradually shift to insulin. So from the 1930s when Lilly first introduced synthetic insulin until today, if you are predisposed or if you are diagnosed diabetic, you will be on insulin. And if you are on insulin, it will be injected. Exubera is a product that was conceived of in the late 1980s. It was researched through the 1990s, and it went commercial in 2006. And it was the first form of purely inhalable insulin. So for the first time, if you were a type 2 or a type 1 diabetic, you wouldn't have to inject. And this is the story of that product. And then what I hope to do is open it up to discussion. This will only be valuable for all of us if you get engaged and ask a lot of questions, because it's absolutely fascinating to trace through what happened with Exuber. And then if we have some time, we can talk a little bit about what's in the future for pulmonary delivery and, and diabetes in particular. So diabetes, there's two types. Type 1, genetic, your body simply does not produce enough insulin for you to metabolize the carbohydrates that you take in. These folks are on insulin from the get-go, okay? Fortunately, technology today has gotten so good that most of these folks are treated with what's called a pump. So they'll wear a little pump with an insulin cartridge, body monitors their glucose levels, and it's automatically administered as they go through their day. The second kind is the one that we'll spend most of our time on. That's type 2 diabetes or diabetes mellitus. So about 90% of cases are type 2. This is the diabetes that develops because of lifestyle and, in a lot of cases, because of predisposition to the disease as well. Right now, it's the seventh leading cause of disease in the United States, but I will guarantee you by the year 2025 that either directly due to diabetes or complications, it will cause more deaths than lung cancer, smoking, and heart disease. So that'll give you an idea of the progression. The cost of dealing with this is absolutely astronomical. Um, talk a few, uh, few numbers in a minute about patients, but the United States has about 23 million type 2 diabetics currently, 10 million give or take into type 1. Global numbers are staggering and growing, but the downstream cost of treating diabetes is into the multiples of billions of dollars, and that's really the problem that we're facing. So that's a little bit of background. In terms of the symptomology of the disease, um, you know, I think most of you know that you get up in the morning, your insulin's at a normal level. For most of it, it's at somewhere between 100 and 110 milligrams per deciliter of blood. Um, your body secretes insulin in response to food intake. So on the left-hand side, you can compare what happens with uh, normal subjects and what happens with diabetic subjects. The red curve is the diabetes guys. So you see what happens with your insulin levels in your blood as you eat and you go through the day. And what you see with the insulin-dependent diabetics on the top is that their body simply can't respond to the sugar load in their body, and as a result, their levels stay high. So technically, if your, it depends on who you want to believe, if your glucose levels stay above 160 to 180, 
you're pre-diabetic, and if they're north of 200 on a consistent basis, then you're diagnosed as diabetic. But your body simply can't produce enough insulin to keep up with the carb intake. So if you look at this market, um, astonishingly, it continues to grow at basically double-digit rates, about 10% a year. Within that, the U.S. population is eh, 8 to 10 percent, give or take. Scary thing is that the number of undiagnosed cases are probably equal to the number of diagnosed cases. So you can roughly multiply that 23 million number by two. And the really scary thing is that the disease preys on certain ethnic populations. So if I go into the Midwest, the odds are 1 in 10 will be type 2 diabetic. If I go into New York City and I go specifically into the African American population, that number goes to about one out of three. And if you're over the age of 35, the odds drop. It's probably one out of two. More frighteningly, within the Hispanic population, especially at younger ages, the disease is roughly one out of two. And it's getting worse. So the costs of dealing with it in the inner city are absolutely astronomical. So there's probably north of 250 million worldwide right now. And what's scary about that number is that those are the ones that we know about. But when we look in populations in rural areas in India, in China, the incidence is going up dramatically. And what's really frightening is that if I look at certain parts of the Asian population or the Indian population, um, in terms of their genetic differences, for some reason, the disease starts faster at a younger age and not with traditional indicators. So for most of us from the West, the indicator would be sedentary lifestyle, um, high caloric intake from sugars, and it would be obesity. That's not really true in the Asian population and the Indian population. It starts earlier, starts at traditional body weight, um, and the question is really why? And it comes back to the behavioral aspects of how we live. Certainly one of the nasty things we've exported as a Western society is our lifestyle. And there's a whole bunch of reasons for that, and I hopefully we'll get a chance to talk about it. But we call this the diabetes equation. First you send to McDonald's, then you send them a Coke, and then Sanofi, Lilly, and Novo, three companies who are customers of mine and produce all of the world's synthetic insulin, come in next. And if you watched how we've evolved, okay, this slide says it all. We used to run around, we'd hunt and gather our food, and basically our caloric intake was at a sustainable level. Calories in burned more out. Nowadays, not really the case. And this is the direction we're going if we don't do something about it to change our behavior. So I've talked a little bit about this. You can see the numbers going out to 2030. Um, it's a terrible problem to have to deal with. On average, if you're a type 2 diabetic, depending on severity and the way you control your disease, you're going to spend between $12,000 and $15,000 a year to manage it. And if you're early onset from your 20s, multiply it out. The math gets very, very scary. So let's talk a little bit about my company. Um, West in the classic definition of a manufacturer is a raw materials converter. So what we do is fundamentally take elastomers, we take synthetic rubber, we take metal, we take plastic, and we make about 40 billion pieces of something every year that get consumed in the healthcare markets. Now what's unique about us is that we specialize in packaging and delivery devices for injectable drugs. We do virtually nothing on the oral side, we do a little bit on the pulmonary side. So we've been around since about 1923. We take the product with our customers all the way from the early part of the development cycle, which the FDA calls preclinical or phase one, all the way through phase three in manufacturing. That can be about 12 years. But we're basically involved in keeping the supply chain safe, secure, and stable through the lifetime of the product. We still make products today that our founder, Herman West, developed back in the early 1930s. So it shows you a little bit about the stability of the business. We're fortunate because our customer base is every major vertically integrated pharmaceutical company around the globe. And that includes the biotechnology guys, the generic guys, as well as the medical device companies. What I deal a lot with right now is the fact that my customer base is shrinking. So if you follow the news over the last couple of years, you've had Sanofi recently by Genzyme. Sanofi and Aventis, a German firm, came together about five years ago. You've had Merck by Shearing Plow. You've had Pfizer by Wyeth. Um, the list goes on and on. Roche acquired Genentech. There's a fundamental shift happening in the world here, which is very interesting, in that 
The guys who made their money on small molecules and random discovery to develop products are all going towards the biological side. So for us in the future, it's all about biologics, of which insulin is one, obviously. So very fundamental shift going on in our industry right now. Um, we manufacture around the globe. We have a very complicated supply chain to deal with. Um, as you can imagine, right now we're dealing a lot with Japan. Uh, we have five factories there in what's called the Tochigi Prefecture, which is to the southwest of Fukushima. So we're okay. Our raw material suppliers are okay, and our customers are relatively comfortable. Um, but on the diabetes side, managing this is, is really quite complicated. So 35 factories around the world, um, several of which are dedicated specifically to diabetes. Um, so how does diabetes relate to West? Well, obviously, we serve the guys that are we're in this segment, but um, we package about 95% of the injectable insulin that goes around the globe. And the remaining 5% is produced by smaller regional players, but Lily Novo and Sanofi, we do 100% of their packaging. So you think, well, what's exciting about that? Well, I thought the same thing when I left NASA and went to this company. But um, this is a 3ML cartridge. It is used in insulin pens in the West dominantly. And what we make is not the glass, but we make this little rubber plunger. And I'll pass this around. I need to get it back. Uh, it's one of the few I have left. My investors take it when I do road shows. There's a little rubber disc underneath the black seal that forms the injection surface. And the way this works is that uh, the patient will basically take his pen. He will insert the cartridge into the device like so. He puts, I'm not going to engage this, but um, he puts a needle on the end of it. He does his blood measurement through his glucose meter, and then he reads how much insulin he needs to inject, and he injects it. So to give you kind of an idea of scale, that little disc is an 8-millimeter disc, which is about 7 tenths of a millimeter in thickness. We make 300 metric tons of that material a year that get pressed into those little discs. That's how much, that's how much um, those insulin cartridges are, are used. They set out in the 90s and raised a ton of money and they began to start working on the problems associated with delivering a small powder technology. In 1995, Pfizer licensed the U.S. rights. At the time, Aventus, the German company, took the European rights. Phase three trials were completed in 2001. So now you've got a three-year gap between when your trial data is done and when you submit what's called your new drug application to the FDA. And then you've got another two years before you finally get marketing approval. And all through this time frame, Wall Street is salivating. Wall Street's calling this the best advance in medicine since we learned how to wash our hands, since we got polio vaccine. And the market's going absolutely crazy. At the height of 2001, with no sales, this company had a market value of $2 billion. Never sold the product, put anything into the healthcare chain, and people valued it at $2 billion. So they get approval. In the meantime, Pfizer, thinking this product is going to be enormous, goes back to Aventus and says, we want to buy the rights out. So they pay a billion, <coughs> billion eight, I think, they buy the licensing rights for Europe, they buy a manufacturing facility in Frankfurt to produce enough insulin, and they're off and running. So July 2006, they go. Now what's interesting about this is that you've got a six month gap between approval and when they finally start getting the product in the marketplace. And what happened here, it depends on who you talk to about the reasons, but they were clearly caught off guard by the fact that the FDA gave them approval ahead of where they thought they were going to be. And at that time, Wall Street was calling for peak sales somewhere north of a billion to two billion dollars. So, you ask yourself, why the lump? Well, it turns out it's a very, very good route of delivery for a number of reasons. Your airways are fairly large at the top, fairly small at the bottom. But to get into the bloodstream, you've got to produce a particle that is about three to five microns in diameter. And you've got to get it into the deep lung here where the wall is really thin to be absorbed into the bloodstream in any meaningful quantity. And certainly you get the therapeutic effect that you want. So when you look at how you get a protein in, the protein is it's effectively a strand of spaghetti. But what's neat about it is that it's got to be in a very specific shape to work once you get it in the body. And when you get it in, it has to maintain that shape to have what's called bioactivity or to work in the way it's intended to. So you've got A, to make the powder in enormous quantities, okay, to get it into the device. You've got to make the device. You've got to prove that you can get these particles into the deep lung. And then you've got to have a measurable decrease in your blood glucose level. 
So 15 years worth of work, basically from 1990 to 2005 to do all of this. Now the complicating factor from an economic standpoint is that um, everybody here has probably used baby powder at some time in their lives. Powders are a monster to handle in manufacturing. And as you go along from the point when you manufacture the insulin, it's sticking to everything. It sticks to your production vessels, it sticks to the floor, to the wall. In effect here, we had roughly about 85% manufacturing losses before we finally got it into the final dosage. I mean, the numbers staggering. So you've got a lot of material loss as you're going forward. In terms of how you get the thing to work, all these things have to be taken into consideration. The scientific advances by Nectar were, were absolutely marvelous in terms of powder production, uniformity of size, uniformity of insulin distribution throughout the particle, the carrier. Um, at the end of the day, you can do all of this work, and it's going to be how does the patient actually use it, um, and we'll come back. But safety was also a major concern. In the lung, what happens when you consistently deliver something? Anybody here smoke? Good. So we know, we know what happens. The lung rigidifies, and at some point it starts to reject what comes into it. Can you, over a lifetime, deliver a powder to the lung and have no change in the physiological function or structure of the tissues deep down? Nobody knew. For three years, we knew it was good. By the way, the early clinical trials are fantastic. Patients love this thing, okay? This is the actual device. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about it in just a second. But, you know, you went from the stigma of shooting yourself up in public to the stigma of looking like you had a bomb in your purse. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that, that was a big issue, as we'll talk about. So, fundamentally, what happens is that the insulin is packaged in a little foil. Remember when you were a kid, you had the caps with the powder things in the two foils? Same thing for this. So the strip is put into the device, the device is primed, there's an air chamber, and very simply, the cap is broken, the insulin is distributed in an aerosol cloud into what's called a chamber, and then the patient, and this is one of the most important things, the patient has to draw in very slowly to get the airflow into the deep lung. If you inhale sharply, it just goes to the back of your throat, and there's absolutely no therapeutic effect. You've got to go back and, and take your, your injector. Um, but the other interesting thing about Exubera is that the FDA does not approve the insulin or the device separately. It approves the two of them in combination as a product. Now this is the first kind of product that the FDA approved like this, where it was the combination of the drug and the device as the final product to be marketed. And were you, make, you were making the device right. partnering with Absolutely, yeah. yeah. We'll come to that. So, from a technical standpoint, as I said, this program's got it all. You've got to produce all powders. You've got to produce a device that can get those powders into the deep lung. You've got to do large-scale manufacturing. And this is where we come in. So we were one of the two manufacturers of the device and began building capacity for this in about 2001. Now, thanks to the foresight of some folks involved with this, it's the best manufacturing contract we've ever done because it made Nectar and their partner responsible for all of the capital costs as well as the possibility of a downstream shutdown if the product wasn't a success, which turned out to be very precious in our case. You had a ton of regulatory hurdles getting this thing through the FDA, and you had the clinical challenges of looking at the data in different types of patients, different types of patient behaviors. So overall, that little device has about 65 components in it. Um, we put about $12 million in total into robotics. Uh, it was assembled into three sub-assemblies and eventually shipped to Nectar and Pfizer um, for final filling. Um, we went from scratch uh, in five years to basically producing these with 100% quality within a couple of years, which was really a tremendous achievement. Unfortunately, the video that I have that shows the manufacturing cell is in an older format. I couldn't incorporate it into the presentation, but it's interesting. It looks like a semiconductor clean room. Everything's self-contained. Components go into a clean wall, cleaner than the wall. And then the final products come out. They're all boxed up, virtually no human intervention. So the program from start to finish goes through about four years. We hit every milestone, did everything we were supposed to do, we delivered every single device on time. We even picked up the slack that the second vendor in the UK couldn't produce. Um, I show this uh, in a couple of different slots, basically to compare the Pfizer insulin to some of the others that were under development. So 
um, as you go down through the table, the key thing to look at is the onset of action in terms of minutes, okay, and the relative bioavailability. So you can see that not only do you have tremendous losses as you're manufacturing this thing, but to have only a fraction of 15% that you deliver available and actually work, okay, or eight to 10, I'm sorry, the number above, versus some of the other products, it's actually very low. And I'll come back and I'll talk about mankind in just a second. So, needless to say, this thing goes to market and undergoes an enormous flame up. And it was very difficult for Pfizer, it basically cost Hank and Kimmel's job, they paid billions of dollars to license it, they paid billions of dollars to invent this to bring the thing in. And I think the Wall Street Journal probably put it best, one of the most stunning failures in the history of the pharmaceutical industry. So despite all of the elegant engineering work done, all of the work from a clinical standpoint, regulatory standpoint, 15 years of effort, um, a bomb completely. So in October, Pfizer announced that they were stepping away. They were returning the manufacturing rights to the folks at Nectar. They took a $2.8 billion write-off on the investment, sold off some of the assets, and they paid Nectar $135 million to exit it as they gave them all of their product rights back. So the question is why? Um, patients love it. As I said, everybody involved in the clinical trials thought it was terrific. Depends on who you want to listen to. The device was cumbersome, yeah, but you can stick it into your purse or your backpack, not too bad. Cost benefit ratio. Um, it was slightly more expensive than injectable insulin, roughly about two times. But I put this into the who cares category. If you get somebody to comply and you don't have the downstream costs, you spend an extra bunch of doses, it's no big deal. <coughs> New therapies, there were some, but not on the insulin front. And we're still kind of there today. The GLP has started to make some ingress in the market. But not to any large extent. Improved needle technology. True. BD, Covidi, and some of the other guys that produce the small insulin syringes learned how to make finer needles, better, more accurate delivery. Probably a little bit with that. Reimbursement. Now we come to the insurance part and the political part. The companies very grudgingly agreed to reimburse patients for the cost and the extra cost uh, from the primary round. And we'll come back to that in a minute, too. There's a lot more to be said there. Dose conversion. Patients want something simple. As a matter of fact, this doctor wants something simple so we'll do it right. You had to convert from one to three to five milligram packages into IUs or international units so that you knew how much to take. People didn't like doing it, often got the math wrong, it was a huge problem. At the end of the day, the real issue was all of the extra things that had to be done to write a prescription. So if you wanted Exuber, you went to your doctor and said, Doc, I want to be put on the pulmonary form. He said, I'll do it, but you've got to take a lung function test. And by the way, you've got to come back in a couple weeks and do another lung function test. And once you start, you've got to come back and do another one. So from the physician, physician perspective, if you're a general practitioner, you're on the clock with your insurance company. Every 15 minutes, you've got to see another patient. Basically, you've got three to four visits before you're going to write a script. So at the end of the day, it was really the docs that killed the product. And I'm one of the few people, and you can turn the camera off now, <laughs> firmly points the finger at Pfizer. I won't judge them. Uh, and Pfizer's a big customer of ours. But Pfizer was a company that focused on pain management and cardiology and did not have an endocrinology sales force for lifestyle management, uh, for lifestyle management disease like diabetes. So they went out, they put their pain task force on this thing. They couldn't sell it right, they didn't know how to get to the GPs, didn't know how to get them the right script. Then they went, they put their pain task force on it. Sales guys, same kind of situation. At the end of the day, um, it basically was their failure to market the product the right way that resulted in its demise. Because the device had a second generation coming through, so you can imagine that's the first generation. The second generation was about two thirds of the size of the pack of cigarettes. Um, and work just as well. And that would have taken the device issue right out of the equation. So it kind of gets us around to the question about is pulmonary insulin dead? Well, at the time that Exubera was going up the curve and getting ready for approval, Lilly had a pulmonary form in development, Nova had a pulmonary form in development. Um, they were spending like crazy to follow on with Exubera, and both of those died. When it came off the market in 07, those programs were both killed. 
except for uh, the technology called technosphere. Anybody here ever hear of a guy named Al Mann? By any chance? Al's one of the more interesting characters you'll ever meet. He's 84 years old. He has started five technology companies, biotech companies, uh, billionaire many times over, huge philanthropist, gives a lot to biomedical engineering. He said, I can do it better. He can do it better to the point where he's put three billion of his own money into the only product remaining that could get approval for pulmonary delivery, and it's called Technosphere. And what's interesting about this product is that if you look on the far right hand side of the curve, you get 28% bioavailability with the same dose as you would have with the exuberant product. But the onset of action happens in 12 to 15 minutes instead of 32. So physiologically, if you're diabetic, okay, it mimics injectable insulin much better and has a faster onset of action, which is what you want. So where is this product? Um, frustratingly, it's awaiting FDA approval. They've done all the clinical trials. They've followed up with a number of trials that the FDA wanted that they didn't have to do initially. And they're basically in, in stasis. And the reason is that they're very concerned about the pulmonary route, obviously, but in secondary fashion, there's been a number of really large failures in the diabetes market recently with some of the oral agents, most notably Avandia from GlaxoSmithKline, which show very slight increase in cardiovascular events. Now they've asked them to go back and prove that it doesn't cause any of these effects and prove the approval. Um, I hope it gets to market. It's terrific technology. They've done a wonderful job of developing it. Uh, more importantly, unlike some of the other oral agents, this does not promote weight gain. So all the patients that were in the long time clinical trial, uh, in fact, lost weight, which is a real big betting when it comes to the diabetes side of the point. So who knows? Hopefully it's not dead. There's a number of other proteins that can be delivered by the lung, and I'm hoping that some of those go to commercial success as well. Um, you see the exuberant device on the left, uh, the mankind technosphere device on the right, um, just innocuous. Open it up, do your blood measurement, take a breath, boom, you're done. So hopefully it'll be successful. Um, the next technology that's coming along is from a very, very neat company up at MIT called Smart Cells. And the guys that developed this technology just sold it to Merck for about $500 million. Now, they haven't even been to market yet. It has not been in human trials yet. It works in rats, which is always a good sign. But the next step is to get it to human trials. But what they've done is figure out a way to encapsulate insulin within a polymer that is sensitive to your blood sugar levels. So if your blood drops below 80 milligrams per deciliter in terms of the glucose concentration, the polymer breaks down and it releases glucose. If the level rises to um, 120, um, or I'm sorry, it releases at 120, okay, it brings it down. If it drops below 80, it stops. So in effect, you can do one single injection for a week or for a month, depending on how they design the system. Um, and hopefully there will be something there. So there are some novel technologies coming. Uh, the really crazy thing about this disease comes back to the insurance and the policy question. So if I'm a healthcare insurer, I'm one of the big guys, okay, I want people getting their treatment even though I got paid for it. And the crazy thing is that we pay more attention to treatment than we do to prevention. So if you're a patient and you go to your doctor and do your complete blood count, you get a reading of 140, 150, you're a little bit worried. You want to go to consult with your nutritionist. What can I do? I need to get my weight down a little bit, I need to get my sugar levels down. It costs you $100 for the visit, the insurance company won't pay for it. They'll bite you tooth and nail. It's absolutely idiotic. By the time you get to the point where you've got complications at the age of 65, you've got diabetic retinopathy, you're losing your eyesight, you need a toe amputated, no problem, we'll fork out five grand for that. Um, so the system's upside down. And what we've got to do is get rid of the perverse incentives for long-term care and somehow get to the behavioral aspects of the disease and focus on prevention. So that'll be up to you guys at some point. Um, right now, we spend about $80 billion a year to treat this disease. Uh, we spend, take a picture number, a couple of trillion on healthcare overall, 15, 16% of GDP. That number with the aging population is going to rise to 30, give or take. You can't afford it. You've got to figure out something to do different. That's my story, and I'll stick you to it. I hope it was informative. Thank you very much. <laughs> this is where the fun part starts. So, yeah. if you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer.
Yeah. It says at the bottom of the uh, device will last for a year. Why is that? Um, what happens is that the powder cakes. Who's got the device? I need my bottom back. <laughs> <laughs> so, as I said, the thing actually breaks down. And what you would do is get this from the pharmacist. And I'm going to try to So, the aerosol chamber, as you can see, this was actually used. It still has a little bit of the residue on the inside, but it's actually from the dishwasher cleaning out the residual powder. What really happens longer term is that this thing, which is called the transjector, it gets caked. And even if you clean it, the amount that you pull out of the capsule into the chamber starts to decrease. So basically it obsoletes itself. I thought you said this was a bubble. So are you involved with this with the uh, Mankind product? Uh, we were all the way up until the end, but we lost the competitive bid. So we finished number two. Yeah. What are your views on the amount of time it takes from, for like a, a pharmaceutical product to go from initial discovery of the first year or whatever, all the way to the 15th year where it's actually marketing? As a part of the industry, do you think that's too long? Do you think that it's overkill? Um, it is the question du jour because if I'm paid by the FDA, um, you know, my job is to protect the public safety, and I get paid to say no. There's absolutely no risk of being delaying things. So there's that side of the coin. Um, we've got to come to grips with the question of 100% efficacy in 100% of the population. Um, I'll give you a good example. A couple of years ago, there was a drug called Resident. Resident was actually a drug for diabetes. It worked in 97 out of 100 patients beautifully. 3% of the population predisposed genetically a single biomarker single, what's called a single nucleotide polymorphism in their DNA, made this drug fatal in terms of liver complications. Do you sell the drug to the 97 that can use it, knowing you've got that small risk, or do you take it off completely knowing that that risk is unacceptable? Um, I think that the system has to change in a way that can control patient access, and we need to start with cancer. So it takes way too long to get cancer therapies in the market. If you've got terminal cancer and you are willing to sign up to the trial, you should have access to the drug. And yet, those classes now are, are protected because of what's called a double-blind random trial. So you may get the drug, you may not. You have to do it, but I think we're much better giving the opportunity for folks to have access to those therapies. It takes too long. I mean, it, as a commercial firm, it's going to take you 12 to 15 years to get a molecule to market. The odds are you patent by the mechanism of the actual chemical structure. You've got six years to recoup an investment that now is approaching a billion dollars, depending on who you want to do. So for me personally, there's a better way to do it. We just need to figure it out. Yeah. Oh, kind of touched on it quickly before, but uh, you've been talking a lot about like corporate social responsibility. And aren't you guys in an extremely uncomfortable situation in terms of preventing diabetes and and earning profit like your profit <laughs> margin? Yeah, yeah. So how, how, how do you handle that? Um, we, we do it in a couple of ways. Obviously, to the Western part of the world, um, we sell to our customers, and our customers actually set the end price and they set the cushion. Um, what we do is make sure that when there are large programs that serve sub-Saharan Africa or parts of Asia or parts of India, for example, polio vaccine, we will provide all our systems at cost. All we ask is our manufacturing costs be covered. Um, and we will participate in any program with any of our customers that seeks to get either vaccines or simple preventive cures into the market as fast as we can. Um, we do a lot of programs with what we call West Without Borders, where First, we will start, um, five years ago, we helped build schools for the blind in Lhasa and Tibet. Um, if you ever get a chance to travel there, I highly advise a fascinating place. Um, where the blind are basically treated as people inhabited by evil spirits and they're pushed off from the inside. It's really horrible to watch. But through that program, what we began to do is get medicines from our partners into the local population and can help prevent some of the simple causes. And, and we like to do it that way. Uh, we fund doctors in Sub-Saharan Africa, um, it's a variation of medicine sans frontieres, but you get physicians in to take care of the simple conditions that can make it an enormous difference. There's a bunch of other things. But yeah, apparently it's a conflict. You know the problems there, but we profit from. Do you cheer for the market to increase or do you want a solution? Why is it not a solution? 
Yeah. Why do you think diabetes is increasing? I know it's its lifestyle. You also said people who are in normal body shape and health are also getting diabetes. Yeah, it's by ethnic subgroup. So you've got a very interesting um, specialty forming now called ethnopharmacology. And whereas 20 years ago, we would do a trial on Caucasians in the United States and assume that it basically applied to every ethnic group, we know now that that's not true. So in the West, we know it's increasing because it's simpler for somebody in a poor neighborhood to go down the street to a Wawa or a Turkey Hill or a McDonald's or a Burger King and consume a meal with high in fat and high in sugar. That's number one. That's why it's happening in the West. The fact that that lifestyle is trans nationally going to these other countries is helping. But we're also learning that there's other biomarkers for the disease and why they're more susceptible. So um, at the end of the day, I'll go back to the talk that was given by the manufacturing group. If you look at our agricultural policy in the United States, I point the finger firmly at the government. The government subsidizes the production of high fructose corn syrup. Extraordinarily cheap calories. If you look at any food you eat to prepare, I would guarantee you that high fructose corn syrup is on the way a lot of it. Um, the chart that you guys showed, the top food companies, man, Coca-Cola, Nestle, General Mills, Post, all cereals, all grains, all high fructose corn syrup. So somehow you've got to incentivize somebody going out and eating spinach salad instead of you know, the double whop with the cheese. Uh, and it, it's hard to change those behaviors, especially when economically they're, they're struggling. been right more times than he's been wrong. But the honest answer is we, we don't know. I mean, you raise a very good point. For the guys that are in the private clinics and don't have the time pressure that the GPs do that are in the big healthcare system, if the patient is going to use the device, yeah, it'll be successful. If the patient learns how to use it and knows it's going to help keep the weight off, all right, they're, they're absolutely going to use it. I'm not sure where the price point is. I would imagine it's probably $2 a dose like the, uh, like the super was. The time will tell. Time will tell. It's interesting too because you would think that patients that have to continually inject would want to go this route for a number of reasons. All the diabetics that were tested, they tried to convert that were on injectable insulin. About 90% of them were comfortable because they knew how to do it. So their behaviors were fixed such that it's no big deal. So we'll see. So maybe hitting the younger market? Yeah, could be. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Is there any type of conversation with the disease actually becoming like durable as opposed to just kind of having insulin to kind of have it slow? Yeah, um, good question. It's incurable. Okay, it simply is incurable. Now, we'll come back to another policy issue because anybody know what the U.S. government's position is on stem cells? Come on, you guys got to read the newspaper at some point. So, under Bush, okay, and you can show me your politics if you want to. Um, you could not do any stem cell research on embryonic stem cells that were not derived from nine original lines. It basically ground our research to a halt. Terrible decision. Under Obama, that's opened up a little bit and we're getting to look at more lines. The only way you're going to cure diabetes is stem cells from the pancreas that you can grow in a scaffold and get to produce insulin once again. We are now eight to ten years behind our counterparts in Korea, Singapore, and China because they haven't had the restrictions on from a policy standpoint to work on these stem cells. And stem cells will be probably the single biggest therapeutic opportunity um, for all of us for the next 80 or 100 years. Yeah, from a marketing standpoint, do you even look to market to consumers with most people taking their prescriptions to supplement their doctors? Is it even worth it? Is that what you guys target? We don't, we don't because we're basically a business to business seller. But when I look at our customers, Pfizer did that. They went direct to market in a big way, direct to consumer. Um, I can remember the ads popping up during the Super Bowl and a bunch of others. And in this case, the damage had already been done at the GP level. Even when people came in to ask, the GP would say, look, 
you've got to come see me for this. It's going to take you this amount of time. I can do it. It's going to cost you more in terms of your copay. It's really not worth your while. And then you have the American Diabetes Association come out right afterwards and say, it's a neat technical product, but we don't advise it. It's less expensive and more reliable to go in general. So they tried the DTC route. Not good. Yeah. Um, what, what exactly about the, the Magpie product is doing you? It's still allowing you to be successful as a consumer or the other two products that you discussed. I, I think one is that they clearly have a technological advantage in terms of the insulin they make, uh, what they call technosphere. They get very uniform particles that are very reliable. You're, you can put into the deep block. And the way you measure this is you put a little radioactive tracer on all the particles. You can put somebody in a CAT scanner and you can actually follow the inhalation of the particles down into the deep lung. Theirs gets much deeper into the lung and higher concentration. That does the exuberant, which you can see from the curves where you see the onset of action and the um, dose delivery. So that's number one. The second is I do believe that the device will give them an advantage. Clearly the way they engineered the device to get the product into the airway and deep is much better than was done with the exuberant. But the big one may be the fact that you don't gain weight. Uh, I'm not sure they know why. Uh, in terms of like, tracing the mechanism of action, I'm not sure any of us do. But for some reason, you don't. And that's a big advantage How have you managed to maintain a 95% market share? That's, that's unbelievable. In um, terms of your business to business, so are, are, are you so big that now companies come to you and they're thinking about a new product? Or yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. I mean, you have to answer for the camera is the sheer genius of management strategic plan. But since most people don't believe that one, it's historic. Um, our products are treated like the FDA treats drugs. So when the customer has something new, they come to us, they ask for a recommendation. We tell them what we think will work. If they do stability, where they put the drug in contact with what we make for a period of two years, if there's no change in the drug concentration, they give their approval after reviewing our files. So we're locked in. Um, and it's, it's, it's very difficult to have to switch unless they want to reduce stability, um, even for a small price decrease. Well, it's, 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 approved, it, it's approved as a package, <coughs> the, it's the drug and the delivery price right. together. Exactly. So, exactly. And we're locked in. The regulatory barrier is enormous. And is that, so you, it, and it may vary from product to product, but is that a contract now that you would have with, with the drug company, or is it just, not necessarily a contract. I mean, like, um, we, we do supply agreements with our customers over a long time. And the reason we're able, we command about a 30% premium to all of our competitors. And the reason we command a premium is that they've got multiple sources of supply within our manufacturing network. We know the regulatory system in Asia, in South America, in Europe, individual countries within Europe, in Russia, US, Mexico, better than anybody else. But more importantly, um, and, and as a scientist, this is what I like and why I joined the company, is that we understand how proteins and chemicals interact with different materials better than anybody. Um, and I first looked at this company and I said, you want me to manufacture rubber and stamp out these little further things the rest of my life? And then you look at it, and to be able to make those things in the quantities that we do that have no harmful impact on the stability of the drug is a tremendous amount of science. So it's those things in combination plus the regulatory barrier that give us some market shares. We have 95% insulin. We have 100% biologics. If you take the Bastin, if you take Epigen, any of the big biologic sellers, we package all of that. Genentech, Roche, Amgen, Biogen, Idec, every single biologic in the market uses our, uses our products. And it's because of that technical knowledge of the industry. A couple of years ago, you mentioned that you were just opening a, a facility plant in, in India. Is that now? Yeah, it's actually China. Um, that plant is up and running. We are building our second plant now, uh, adjacent to that one, and we are building in India probably at the end of the year. Everything's gone very well. Um, India is a challenge for us because if you follow generic production, seven out of 10 generics now come out of India for export. They've got 160 FDA approved plants, number two behind the US. Extraordinarily good at the size of the chemistry of pharmaceutical production. We've got to be there. So that you'll be up and running there? Probably 2014. Yeah. But not be able to improve. It takes a long time. Yeah. Because of the nature that you're in, like the policy you have to do is 
kind of seems like it's not really optional for people to, to buy it, like regardless of what their like their financial you know situation is. I mean, because if you have diabetes, you kind of need your product. They, they need our customers' product. Right. right. Yeah. yeah. So then, I mean, does, does that make your company kind of uh, less follow during like recession times than, than other companies would be? Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. We looked at some of the value play. We're not going to grow as fast. But we've got tremendous operating cash flow that allows us to do all of our investments without going to outside financing sources. Um, we reliably pay a dividend, and you'll have ups and downs every once in a while, but we're very, very stable. Um, this afternoon, for the other section, I'm going to give a talk on an accident that occurred in one of our plants uh, back in 2003. We had an explosion that took that plant out of our manufacturing network. <coughs> Um, and it caused a panic within the pharmaceutical industry because they thought we weren't going to be able to make up the loss of production. Um, but the way we designed our disaster recovery and the way that we had our operation plan um, wasn't even a blip on the screen. I may have the only thank you letter in my files from the FDA uh, with regard to a for profit firm in the healthcare sector in the U.S. thanking us for getting back up online so quickly. But yeah, we're a little bit more stable.